The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now on that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it, was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the past week, there have been four incidents of people being shot for being in the wrong place, being a stranger. The first was a 16-year-old boy who knocked on the wrong door. He was shot twice. The second was a six-year-old and her father who went to retrieve a basketball that had rolled into someone's yard. The third was a young woman who drove into the wrong driveway. She was killed. The last were two teenagers who got into the wrong car. One young woman killed, five injured, all in one week for making a mistake that probably all of us have made at one time or another. How many of you have knocked on the wrong door, drove into the wrong driveway, walked into someone's yard to retrieve a ball or tried to open the door of a car that looked like yours. Pretty sure I've done all of these things in the last year. These were all different areas of the country. The victims were young, but that was really all they had in common. The perpetrators all seemed to have little in common as well. <coughs> Seems to me that the only common denominator is fear particularly fear of strangers. None of the victims were known to the people who did the shooting. And what I want to know is how we got to this point, where four different people thought the best thing to do was not simply ask a question or wait 10 seconds to find out why the person was in the wrong place, but instead just shoot. How did we get to this place? One of the interesting things about the resurrection accounts is that the disciples never recognized 
Jesus, not at first. He was always a stranger to them. It's not clear as to why his closest friends and disciples didn't recognize him. Some hypothesize that it could have been post-traumatic stress. And that makes sense when you think about it. Listen to what Simon and Cleopas told Jesus. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Jesus had been their chance at redemption and freedom, and now he has been killed by the very people he was supposed to free them from. The Romans. They had hoped. They had put all their hope in this man, and now he was dead. They were coping with two kinds of trauma. The violent death of someone who they loved, and the lost hope. Anytime someone we love dies, we experience a tremendous loss. And sometimes that comes with losing hope, hope for a future with someone who is no longer living with us. Yet Jesus had promised more than just a future with him. He had promised salvation and freedom. He had promised redemption and healing to all people. And when he was killed, people were terrified that all those promises were lost. It was a trauma of epic proportions. Embedded in trauma is fear. Fear of what will happen next. Knowledge that while we may have survived this trauma, we might not survive the next. Fear is what made it so difficult to recognize Jesus, to believe that it could be the living Christ. On Easter, I talked about Mary Magdalene's relative lack of fear. I hypothesized that she was able to handle her fear because of the afflictions that she had coped with in her life. She didn't recognize Jesus immediately, but it didn't take her very long. It took longer for the men in our gospel reading today. I think these two men who met Jesus on the road had a little more fear than Mary did. This is the first time we even hear their names, so they probably didn't have a close relationship with Jesus as Mary and the apostles. And they were heading away from Jerusalem. They were basically fleeing the scene. They were scared. So it took them longer, longer to recognize Jesus, longer to remember the hope that they once had. But they eventually did. They did because they spent time with him, listened to him, got to know this man who they thought was a stranger. And the more time they spent with him, the less fear they had. The reason they were able to overcome that fear was because hope was still there. They might have lost their hope for a time, but they never forgot. And it was that foundation of hope that saved them. To some varying degree, almost everyone in our world is dealing with some kind of trauma, which means that everyone is afraid. Not only that, but we have become isolated. It was happening before the pandemic, and it's that much worse after, or, you know, kind of after COVID. <laughs> we also have this wonderful 24-hour news cycle that seems to feed off of fear which really isn't helping. So what's different now? Why are people so quick to shoot the stranger in front of them? Part of it is because we have become isolated and it's easy to avoid people who are different than us. Many people are able to avoid interacting with anyone who is not like them. It's also because fewer people have the foundation of hope that our faith gives us. It's only, it's one thing to deal with fear and loss when you have a foundation of hope and love. It's another thing to deal with that when you have no hope to begin with. And that is much more 
dangerous. Everything that has happened over the last week and several years it makes me angry. It makes me want to lash out and blame someone or something. And that is what a lot of people are doing. But that just feeds the fear and hopelessness. John Meacham wrote, fear points at others, assigning blame. Hope points ahead, working for a common good. Fear pushes away, hope pulls us closer. Fear divides, hope unifies. As people of faith, we cannot allow ourselves to fear the stranger and blame the other. We can't isolate ourselves in safe havens of hope and comfort. We have to share this hope that God has given us. Because people are starving for this hope in our world. And that dearth of hope is killing people. It is literally killing people. So what can we do? We can stop blaming the other political party, <laughs> whatever that may be. We can stop blaming the other. We can stop letting fear be our guide when we have a much better guide in Jesus Christ. Notice that Jesus walked with the disciples, and they walked with him, even though they thought he was a stranger. In the same way, we can start walking along others, even the people who scare us a little. Now, I'm not telling you to start knocking on strangers' doors. But there are safe ways that you can get to know people who are different than you. And if you aren't quite ready for that, try to talk to someone you know who you might not agree with <laughs> and talk about those things. We are so busy avoiding talking about the things that upset us that it means we no longer understand where we are coming from. That means that people that we know are becoming strangers. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 139. And the first line is, Lord, you have searched me and known me. It's all about the God who knows us so well, because he formed our inward parts. It is a gift to be known by God. Being known by an all-loving being is what gives Christians the strength to deal with trauma and pain. And it's not just us who God knows. Sometimes we think that maybe just God knows us better than everyone else. But God knows all his children. So let's think about that. The next time we see someone who makes us a little nervous, a little wary, remember that they too are created in God's image. Because for God, there are no strangers. Amen. Amen.